Happy Pride! I have a short preamble before the questions, but if you would prefer to get right to them, they start at this time code and they've all been timestamped below. One thing I've learned since my own coming out is that trans people are not a monolith. But we are wide and varied Venn diagrams. We don't go through all of the same things, but we do go through a lot of the same things. I think if I'd known more about what other trans people went through and been able to compare that with what I was feeling and see where it lined up, I would have figured it out sooner. So the very least I can do is share my experiences and hope that they resonate with someone else who needs to hear it. Thus, I decided to open the floodgates to my Discord server and my Patreon for a Q&A. Any question they might have had about my experiences, my transition, whatever. Even the invasive stuff you're usually not supposed to ask. This was their chance. I will answer their questions with the assumption that they were asked in good faith with genuine curiosity, and I've kept who asked what anonymous. I would like to do more videos like this, so if you have any questions that aren't answered here, feel free to ask them in the comments or my retro spring, which I've linked below, and they can be answered at a later date. And also, if you are any form of trans yourself, I encourage you to also answer these questions in the comments or to adapt them to better fit your experience. There are countless perspectives that will almost certainly not be touched on in this video, and I would like to give them more of a platform. And with any luck, this will be found by someone questioning or in the process of figuring themselves out or coming out and maybe help them put a piece or two together. That's my only goal for this. For that reason, this video is not monetized. This is a public resource untouched by ads, hopefully. Though I thank my Patreon patrons whose names are scrolling past right now. I would eventually like to have enough support on Patreon that I can remove all ads from all of my channels, but I'm not there yet. Please consider supporting it and maybe one day. A few disclaimers. One, I will be speaking frankly about subjects that could be potentially upsetting, including mental and physical health, depression, dysphoria, the good and bad of before and after I came out. I am going to answer them as honestly as I can. I allowed not safe for work questions about explicit subjects like sex and sexuality, but they have been saved for the very end of the video, and viewers will be prompted again before I answer them if you would prefer to not hear that. It may come up in other questions in less explicit details, though. Two, I am a binary trans woman. I am also able-bodied and white. So there are countless trans experiences that will differ from mine, and that's one of the reasons I encourage fellow trans people to answer these questions in the comments themselves. If this video can be an even wider resource for more people, then all the better. Three, I live in Sacramento, California in the United States, which has many protections and support systems for trans people that are not available everywhere in the US let alone the entire rest of the world. I also have a very supportive family, so all of that will affect my experiences post coming out. Many trans people across the world have not had it anywhere as easy as I have, and I do not take that for granted. All I can hope is that this video helps someone. So let's get to the questions. A family member of mine has come out as trans, but they are not out to everyone, so I don't want to disrespect them. How do I refer to them in front of others? In that situation, you'll want to ask them directly how you should refer to them, especially if they have reason to not be out to everyone. Misgendering and dead naming is shitty, but if they're still waiting to come out to more people on their own time, the alternative is outing them before they're ready. Frankly, that's even worse, because it's both what they should be allowed to do themselves, it's their journey and story, and because it can potentially be dangerous for them. It might be a slightly awkward question to ask them, but it's much better than to just guess. How difficult was choosing a new name, and was it hard to get it officiated on all documents? Choosing my name wasn't very hard at all, though I did privately try out Jacqueline or Jackie for several years. I think around 2018 I decided I wasn't a Jackie, so while trying to think of something else, I considered how I always liked my dad's name more than my dead name, which was also my middle dead name and the only one I'll share here, Michael. There's a direct feminine form of that. Michaela, and soon as I thought of that, I was like, ooh, I like Michaela, and that's the one that stuck. I also always liked being called Thorn more than my dead name. It comes from my main online handle, Thornbrain, so everyone was calling me Thorn already, so I adopted it as my middle name. So yeah, Michaela Thorn is really just my first and middle names. I also knew right away that I wanted to adopt Miki as my preferred diminutive, entirely because of Miki Berenyi from Lush. When I first came out on Twitter, I said I was going to keep my dead name as a second middle name because there are women named it, so it's kind of gender neutral. And I intended to for about a week, and then as soon as I started filling out the paperwork for my name change petition and remembering how much I hated ever being called it or just hearing it spoken out loud, the sound of it, I knew I never wanted to be called it ever again. 
dropped it for good. Getting my name officiated was also not too hard, but it was a very long, protracted process. It took about two years to fully sort it out because of a variety of reasons, mainly just confusion. <laughs> It won't take that long if you do it right. There are thankfully volunteers here in California who help with that. If you're in Sacramento like I am, look up genderhealthcenter.org. They helped me get things rolling. Or otherwise, search up if there's anything similar in your city or county, like in your community center. There are volunteers and pro bono lawyers out there ready to help with the paperwork. Or at least get you the right paperwork and tell you how to fill it out and where to send it what the right process to go through is. It took so long for me because one, this was the middle of the COVID lockdown, so all of my paperwork had to be sent through the mail. I couldn't meet the court clerk or judge in person. Two, it was, I think, six weeks of processing every time I would send something in and then it would get sent back requesting some sort of correction. I had to get my identity confirmed with a notary like three different times. When I finally had the court order confirming my legal name change, and I sent in the form to get a new birth certificate. It took like another year before I finally had my real name in my hands. And Thorn was misspelled Tom. Like Tom York, for like three months, my legal middle name was Tom. So I sent in another form to get the typo corrected. And this one took even longer for a reason I couldn't discern. But this time, I finally had my real, corrected birth certificate with my own name on it. And then it was just a matter of going to the DMV to get my ID, and then I could update it everywhere else. Again, a long, messy process, and if it weren't for the volunteers here in California, I could still be trying to sort it all out, so I thank them profusely. What started cracking your egg? It's hard to say, because I figured out relatively early on that I wasn't 100% cis, but I spent 10 odd years in very sideways denial about it. I decided early on that I must be a transvestite, like Eddie Izzard. Yeah, uh, Susie is also now out as trans. I quickly amended that to gender fluid or gender queer, but I never actually felt like I was either. What had happened was I had taken the idea that gender is a social construct, which it is, but extrapolated that to mean whatever I felt about my gender didn't actually matter. And therefore, I'll wear whatever I want in secret, but I'll never actually examine what I'm feeling and I'll be functionally a cis man forever. The longer this went on, the more obvious it was that I didn't really connect with gender fluidity. And I briefly said that I was non-binary, but I knew within a month that wasn't accurate either. I remember telling my partner at the time in 2015 that I wanted to go on HRT while still in denial about it. I think the one thing that finally started cracking my egg for real was just seeing myself in the mirror between 2019 and 2020 and how much more haggard and sad I looked each day and realizing that every time I saw myself, I wished I was a girl instead of that. After 10 years, I'd reached an irrefutable truth about myself that I hated being a man and I wished I was a woman and I couldn't keep living if I was never going to transition. Was there anything that made you feel especially confident in the realization that you're trans? Honestly, even as I was coming out to everyone, my friends, my family, that entire first year I was out as I was going through all that name change rigmarole and trying to find a good clinic that could prescribe me HRT, sharing my coming out story in a fundraiser stream for my transition, I was doubting myself the whole time. I would sometimes think to myself that if it turns out I'm wrong about all this and I'm not actually a woman, it's gonna be a mess to undo it all. Yeah, I learned that when your eggshell was as thick as mine was, sometimes you keep carrying a lot of its pieces with you until you're finally comfortable with yourself. I wasn't truly, totally confident in my transness until I had finally started HRT, because after three or four days, I had the sudden realization that I felt good. Nothing had happened per se to make me feel good in the moment. I think I was just walking from my bed to my chair at the computer. But I noticed out of nowhere that my plain neutral state felt tangibly happier than it used to. A site I want to shout out is the Gender Dysphoria Bible. It's a great resource to anyone who might be questioning their gender or is just curious about transness in general. I didn't know about it until this last year or so, long after I was out and proud. But I wish I had read it back when I was in the closet because it resonated so much with my experience experiences. The Dysphoria Bible has a chapter on biochemical dysphoria, and reading that connected the dots with how I felt before and after HRT, how consistently drab my neutral state was on testosterone, compared to how good it feels now on estradiol, and how consistently chipper and 
perky I am? My little joke is that I transitioned to perky goth because it's almost literal. Finally treating my biochemical dysphoria and getting the right hormones in my body was the last key I needed to finally be totally confident and comfortable in my transness. I needed that irrefutable truth before I could accept that I'm a trans woman, and I needed another before I fully believed it. Denial's rough. At this point, I should stop and clarify something. You can be trans without ever experiencing gender dysphoria. Some real backwards and shitty gatekeepers insist that you do, but the actual rest of the world is moving away from gender dysphoria as a clear indicator and leaning towards gender incongruence instead. The simple desire to be another gender. If you'd rather be another gender, you're trans. Dysphoria is not the problem, it's a symptom of the problem. And that's because truthfully, dysphoria is such a wide, diffuse thing that you can't totally pin down. Everyone who's lived with it has different examples of how it manifested for them. Many of those examples are shared with other trans people, but many of them are not. A lot of them could easily be explained by something else in your life that isn't dysphoria. And when you're in denial, you will cling to those explanations. I sure did. Also keep in mind, cis people experience gender dysphoria. It's not just us. Like I said earlier, the reason I wanted to make this video is because, like when I read the dysphoria bible, so many things about my transness clicked after hearing other trans people's experiences and seeing where they lined up with mine. The clinical, medical definitions of transness, the cliches and stereotypes that we've grown up with and expect to adhere to in order to be trans, those do not help you unpack your gender, and if you even have experienced it, how dysphoria actually manifested in your life. It's like how it's so important for adults who were never diagnosed as neurodivergent, but think they might be, to self-diagnose. It's because the medical and psychological worlds are so behind in understanding what neurodivergence even looks like in adults, because those people have probably grown up in a world that expects all people to be neurotypical by default, and if you're not that, then you'll be forced to act like it. Go figure, there's a big overlap between neurodivergence and transness. If you want another article to read, I'll have a link to Natalie Reed's piece on what she called the Null Hypothesis. It's from 2012, and the terminology is outdated in a very weird, inconsistent way, but it does present the helpful idea to anyone questioning their gender to put both transness and cisness under the same scrutiny. A lot of denial comes from believing that being cisgender is the default, and being transgender is an aberration. Therefore, you need overwhelming proof that you're trans before you'll believe it. But you never need to provide evidence that you're cisgender. It's expected. But you'll accomplish a lot more when you force yourself to provide as much evidence for the possibility that you're cisgender as you would for if you're trans. One of those will not hold up under scrutiny. That's another one that if I'd read it while I was in denial, I probably would have looked much harder at my gender and figured it out sooner. I'll link a couple other Am I Trans articles for anyone who wants to take that dive. What did your transition goals look like when your egg cracked? Have they changed over the years? From day one, I knew I wanted to go on HRT, I wanted big breasts, and I wanted to get rid of my facial and body hair. All of those have held. I haven't gotten breast augmentation as of this video, but I will be talking to my doctor about it this very month. Happy Pride. Though even my small estro breasts make me smile so much. It took a year and two weeks from coming out before I found the right clinic and got on HRT. It helped a lot that my specialist was actually trans himself. That was so important to me, and he's just such a cool, fun guy. Shout out to Trans Masks. You guys have helped me a lot more than you know. I was finally on estradiol and the testosterone blocker Spear on a Lactone. While I still want to get permanent hair removal, and in fact I'm finally getting some appointments set up for electrolysis as of writing this video, HRT has actually made my leg hair thinner and lighter, and it's much less noticeable, even if I go a whole month without shaving them. My facial hair still grows back and gets scratchy really fast, so I want that taken care of first. But I'm actually not too bothered with my leg hair anymore. I do still want to get rid of it, it grows back really quick too, but I don't even think about it most of the time anymore. Now, Spironolactone has a few common side effects. The biggest one is that you pee a lot, so you're constantly losing water and sodium and need to take more in. We'll actually come back to that in a later question. Another one is brain fog, which I didn't experience too much of, but often enough that I noticed it. I'd get several days in a row where I couldn't really work on anything. But my estradiol count was really high, my testosterone was really low, and it felt great. 
This was where the first big changes to my transition goals comes in, because for pretty much my entire adulthood, I had always intended to get a vasectomy. I've never wanted kids, I have no parental instincts whatsoever, no way in hell am I getting anyone pregnant. But around this time last year, I saw another trans femme talking about recovering from her orchiectomy, which is the total removal of the testes. And that clicked on a light in my head of, oh right. I could get rid of them entirely. I could go off Spiro and no longer deal with the side effects. In fact, not only did I never want to be a parent, I never liked having testicles. I don't want them. I would get rid of them if I could. I can. And not only did I, picture from when I woke up from surgery, but as a friend pointed out, I got my orchiectomy in November, meaning I won No Nut November for life. That's even better than getting someone with bophiectomy, if you know you know. Another big change is that now that I've had my orchi, I'm reconsidering how I feel about my genitals on the whole. I'm one of the people who explored gender while in the closet through gender transformation art and comics, where everything transformed. Plus, I almost never actually enjoyed sex. Again, anything more explicit than that is for the end of the video. Recently, while looking back on all that and unpacking it, and comparing that to how HRT has changed my body and how I feel and enjoy being inside it now, it's occurring to me that maybe I'm not as attached to the rest of this as I thought I was. I want to shout out another blog called Stained Glass Woman by a fellow trans femme named Zoe. The gal who asked this question actually introduced me to the blog, so thank you for that. Zoe calls it peeling the onion. As your transition goes on and the more pressing issues are taken care of, like getting my new birth certificate and IDs and getting on HRT, other stuff that's been buried under the surface starts to appear and take priority. And it's not unheard of to not decide until months or years into your transition that you do actually want bottom surgery. When I came out, I thought I'd always stick with what I was born with, but now that I'm two years on estradiol and happily post-orky, I am putting some serious thought into an eventual vaginoplasty. Still don't know for sure yet, but it's way more of a possibility than it was three years ago. I got another question asking if I had or am considering any affirming surgeries. So yeah, got my orky, planning electrolysis and breast augmentation, and considering vaginoplasty. Facial feminization surgery, or FFS, is lower on the maybe list, because I've luckily always had an androgynous face and appearance, so it's less of a pressing issue, but it is also on the maybe list. I have always hated my forehead. If more bottom surgery is now an option, then never say never. Another thing that changed, and you can easily track this with just the videos on this channel, is how I feel about my voice. A couple people actually asked about this, so let's get into those questions next. How does your voice feel now? Does hormone therapy change it in any way? Sadly, estradiol does not affect your vocal cords. Testosterone does. If you're trans mask and you go on T, it will actually thicken your vocal cords and make your voice deeper, but E doesn't do anything to them. When I came out, I wasn't too self-conscious about my voice. It was pretty deep, and a few people over the years complimented it and called it sexy. And that's great when you're presenting as a man, but the longer I was out, the more I wished I had a higher, cuter voice. I could get surgery on my vocal cords to make my voice higher and inherently breathier, but it could affect my ability to speak, and I need that to make videos, so that wasn't really an option for me. So I started speaking more in what's called your head voice. It's more up in the nose than down in the chest where I used to speak from, and I got my trans specialist to refer me to a speech therapist. He helped me practice talking at a higher pitch, tongue and lip positioning, how to build up resonance in my head voice so I didn't need to speak from the chest to project or to present a video like this, and to speak more breathily, which is inherently more feminine sounding. Another person had asked, how is your voice training going? I can always seem to hear you develop it more and more as you post more videos. Are you close to where you want to be? After a couple of months of working with him and continuing to practice for about a year since, what you're hearing is mostly how I speak on instinct now. It is more practiced and presentational for the sake of the video, and I have been fighting my sinuses and my ears plugging up all month to even film this video. And in filming right now, allergy season is fun, but I don't slip into my deeper register much anymore. I'll keep practicing and maybe even get more comfortable letting myself sound deeper again. Women with deep voices are sexy, but yes, I definitely like how I sound a lot more now. After your vocal training, has it become easier or harder to sing or do comical voices? Since I remember you mentioned getting vocal fry during the CDI recordings. 
We did the two main Zelda CDI games on my Let's Play channel recently. Links in the description. I do sometimes get a bit of vocal fry, but that comes more from going long periods without doing a lot of talking at one time like the months between video recording sessions. When that happens, I just have to rest my voice and try again a couple days later. The CDI recordings? I had to re-record all of them. Same with my ears plugging, which always happens when I start recording. It's going on right now. I haven't actually done much singing or voice acting at all these last few years. In fact, I've had no motivation or passion to make music, so that hasn't come up. And most of the funny voices I do in Let's Plays, for example, are within my old vocal range. I haven't lost that vocal range. I can drop down into it if I want, even all the way down to Giro if I need to. I just don't speak in it on instinct anymore, and I'm trying to adapt my higher feminine manner into funnier voices so I don't have to. What has been the best and worst part of your transition? The best part has been the one I mentioned about my neutral state being a lot happier. Consistently I feel good, I'm in a good mood, even cheerful. I used to hate seeing my own reflection or being on camera or anything. I always wanted to be hidden. Now most of the time I look in the mirror, even if I haven't shaved for a few days, I like how I look. I even gained a lot of weight during lockdown and after I started hormones, and I used to be a lot more self-conscious about it, but now, not anywhere as much as I used to be. I'm hoping that after I get breast dog and it takes focus away from the rest of my torso, I won't even care anymore. The worst part is all the waiting, both the legal stuff and just the months between appointments with doctors. It's the state capital, everyone is busy, it happens. But even just scheduling standard appointments to talk to someone, it's usually not going to be for two or three months. My previous health insurance company was also friggin' useless and rejected every referral my doctor sent in. Even though California requires that healthcare for trans people follows the WPATH standards of care, which say that everything we'd asked for them to approve is in fact medically necessary. When my pro bono lawyer finally forced them to approve my referral for speech therapy, they didn't send it to the ears, nose, and throat clinic that we asked for where the speech therapist works. They sent it to the OBGYN. No joke, after three years of them jerking me around and those lawyers having to jerk them back with legal threats, thank you guys profusely. I was told that at the start of the new year, right after my Orky and while I'm waiting to finally begin electrolysis, my health insurance company would no longer be available in my district. I genuinely think that they were so consistently useless that someone noticed and they were kicked out of Sacramento. In contrast, my new insurance company actually approves our referrals when we ask for them. So any trans people watching, if you can help it, don't join Aetna. Side note, one of the reasons I loved my trans specialist was that when I told him about the first rejected referral, I think for speech therapy, he shook his fist and said, we are going to crush them. And then he cautiously asked me, do you want to crush them? <laughs> He ruled. If you somehow see this, you're a goddamn rock star. How has your body felt over the time you've been on HRT? Without getting explicit, that's for later. I did notice my body becoming more sensitive overall within the first six months or so. My neck and shoulders got more sensitive to touch. When breasts start to develop, they're super tender and the slightest bump will hurt. But that actually faded after the first half year or so and they don't get sore anymore. It's pretty common to be affected by cold more easily, and sometimes I am, but I've always had a decent tolerance for as cold as Sacramento ever gets. I don't feel like I'm freezing very easily. I could go for a walk in 40 degrees Fahrenheit in short sleeves and yoga pants and I'm fine. It's also not unheard of to experience monthly period symptoms like cramps and diarrhea, but I don't think I do. But then I've always had digestion issues, so I have no idea if it's the estradiol or not. Does the stereotype about pickles hold true here? And I don't mean that as NSFW, I mean stuff like the trans femme experiences involving food cravings. So yes, that stereotype has a big grain of truth to it. It has to do with testosterone blockers like spironolactone, which is a diuretic. So you store a lot of potassium and pee a lot, and thus lose a lot of water and salts that you have to consistently replenish. That tends to lead to cravings for salty foods, and the go-to example is apparently pickles. It does not hold true for me though. Not because I didn't get the cravings, I absolutely did, I salted everything. But I just don't like pickles. I don't like the astringency of vinegar. I waited for the cravings to change that and they just never did. But I do love speared and salted cucumbers. Just split a cucumber and sprinkle it with kosher salt. That is a good snack. My throat is tired, I'm gonna film more tomorrow.
Okay, we can keep going now. I'm a trans man, but I've only semi-recently, breed within the last few years, begun to identify as such. One thing I've been realizing is that the complicated and generally negative feelings I've had towards my body ever since I was a teenager has probably been dysphoria this entire time. It's just that even when I knew that trans people existed, it never occurred to me that what I was feeling could count as gender dysphoria, because the definitions of it are always very non-specific. And I'm autistic, so if you experience dysphoria and you're comfortable talking about it, how does it feel for you? That's exactly like what I mentioned earlier. It's why dysphoria isn't the best indicator of transness, because it's such a wide and varied spectrum of feelings that really only makes sense in hindsight. I went through the same thing of knowing trans people, even personal friends or people I'd meet in person, but never properly connecting it with what I was feeling, mostly because of my denial. Also, my trans friends were mostly trans mask and NB, so kind of just didn't penetrate. I don't experience much dysphoria anymore, but I can definitely tell in hindsight how I did. Dysphoria for me was an invisible wall isolating me from everyone and everything else, and even my own sense of self. I would look in the mirror and never totally believe that I was actually looking at myself. I could recognize it was me, but there was always this thought as I did of, that's really me? And especially as I got closer to my 30s and cared less and less for myself, I just really grew to loathe that guy in the reflection. I hated that I had to be him. By contrast, when I look in the mirror now, I like what I see and start smiling involuntarily. I also used to fear being seen smiling. I was both really distant and really high strung. I had anger issues since high school and the resting bitch face to go with it, and it took as little as dogs barking next door to set me off. I would smack the wall of my room to make them stop, which would break holes in it, and it took me going too far and punching through my window before I realized I needed to stop and sort myself out. But I didn't bother examining the root of my anger issues. I just stopped responding to them. I didn't cry the entire time between puberty and estradiol. At most, I'd get a little choked up. I barely processed any emotion that wasn't angry or sexual. I just repressed everything else, or at worst, didn't even feel it. I think I was so drawn to comedy and laughter because only through laughing did I ever feel truly joyful. And it's worth mentioning, since starting E, if I laugh too hard, it completely collapses into just a senseless, sobbing wail. I stop laughing and start crying. That's how much joy overtakes me when I laugh now. It's like my body's trying to catch up after 15 years of repression. I couldn't take compliments, no matter how big or small. They just made me uncomfortable and awkward, and I wouldn't know how to respond. I never wanted anyone to talk to me or approach me. I had terrible stage fright and couldn't handle being in front of a group. I never wanted to be in a photo or on camera. If I ever took pictures or did a travel vlog or anything, I was always behind the camera taking POV. I would try to stay out of the shot as much as I could. I never felt totally comfortable presenting a video like this. And I did several pre-transition, but trying to put myself on camera, I lost the motivation to keep making them really fast. Even though I thought I had a decent knack for it, I never felt like wearing anything other than a black band t-shirt and blue jeans. I knew I loved black and wanted to embrace my goth side that entire time, but my sense of goth is very tied to femininity, so I felt like I could never actually explore it. Even though when I'd secretly dress up feminine and put on makeup, it was the only time I really liked seeing myself. Presenting masculine, no matter whether I thought I looked good or not, part of me just hated seeing myself and hated being seen. And that extended to sharing my own identity and interests with my family. Everything about me had to be hidden from them. I didn't want to sit with them and talk with them, and I definitely didn't want to share anything I was working on. I wanted to be perpetually alone. I am an introvert who was bullied off and on as a kid. That's surely part of it, but it's tangible the difference between how I felt when I'd interact with people pre-HRT and how I feel when I do now. Maybe don't turn all attention on me. I do have anxiety, but I handle it a lot better now. There is more I could say about my dysphoria, but it's gonna have to wait for the NSFW section. Does anything in retrospect make way more sense? Like, my love and fascination of Twelfth Night was kind of hilariously fitting as an NB, for example. I mentioned that I was into gender transformation art. That definitely makes more sense now, especially since it does much less for me since HRT. 
Articles on the trans relation to kink also in the description. The way I connected with women-led bands like Lush and Susie and the Banshees definitely makes more sense now. Even if they weren't my main favorites, like They Might Be Giants, there was always something uniquely special about my love for their music. I never got into Ranma one half, but I know a lot of trans people did pre-coming out. I think a friend in middle school tried to get me into the manga, but I just never picked it up. Maybe she knew something I didn't. Every time I played a game with a character creator, and I especially noticed I did this with Souls Likes, any male character I made could look like anything. Often even look like an episode of Monster Factory. When I started making female characters, and eventually exclusively female characters, they all looked the same. I charted my transition with Bloodborne and Code Vein, and from what I understand, that is an extremely trans femme experience. Most of the stuff that makes sense in hindsight is tied with my dysphoria, not wanting to be seen, not caring about my appearance, anger issues. I didn't relate to The Matrix, at least not at the time, but I have a distinct memory as a kid of wondering if the entire world as I was experiencing it was actually a dream, and I've been asleep this whole time in a sleeping bag on the living room floor during a sleepover for some reason. And one day I'll wake up, I'll have been lying there the whole time, and my whole life wasn't actually happening. And also that constant prevailing sense that I was never really seeing myself in my own reflection. Abigail Thorne from Philosophy Tube, no relation, had something similar in her coming out video, a character she called the man who isn't there, which is her pre-transition self that she would see in the mirror and feel like it was someone else entirely. Her coming out was like two weeks on the dot after mine, and her videos helped me a lot in the lead up to my coming out, so that was a lovely bit of my life coming full circle. But I didn't immediately relate to the idea of seeing someone else in my reflection, until I started HRT a year later and was finally present in my own body. Now I can see how much I also felt like I was looking at someone else. I definitely had at least some symptoms of depersonalization and derealization. That feeling of a wall between me and the world is pretty common. How much do you think your gender feels are tied to guilt? For clarity, this is coming from two different trans femme friends having guilt-related things, and it's interesting to examine as a DFAB wandering off the spectrum. DFAB and AFAB mean pretty much the same thing, for the record. I have heard of trans femme people, especially trans lesbians like me, feeling guilt and shame about who they are. Internalized misogyny, bigotry, and compulsory heterosexuality run deep, but I've been lucky to never feel that about being trans or a trans lesbian. You couldn't make me feel bad about being trans. I think being trans is cool as hell. It is such an interesting and exciting thing for a person to go through, and it comes in so many forms that overlap in so many different ways, I never get tired of learning about it. If I do feel guilty about anything, it's the youth as my true self that I'll never get to experience. We talked semi-recently in my Discord about proms, and I admitted that I never went to any of mine and never wanted to, but if I had been my true self in high school, I would have been... 30% more likely to go. I also realized recently just how much I missed being friends with women. This is apparently also pretty common among transbians, I'll link to another article about it. The majority of my friends in middle school were girls. I thought I was just one of those boys who got along well with girls, but actually, before and after that, my friends were mostly boys. And being friends with those girls was the last time before, like, my current friend group, where I felt totally right among my friends. I struggled all the way through high school and beyond with finding a place among a group of people where I felt like I actually belonged. I love my mask friends dearly, and I'm very lucky I have them, but I've still realized there's a big piece missing in my life that is my connection to other women and I do feel sad and guilty about it. Never mind all of the past friends who may never know me as my true self. Did you ever struggle with feeling like it was too late to transition? If so, how did you deal with that? To an extent, yes, I would see much younger people coming out and transitioning, including at least one young teenager who I knew personally, and getting it in my head, oh, okay, that's the new deadline to transition, sucks to be me. I think it helped that so many people closer to my age and older were always coming out, so it helped to quiet that irrational thought in my head. You can be any age in transition, it's entirely about when you actually feel like you're ready. Part of the reason I did finally come out was I was 29. I'd spent my entire 20s unraveling my identity, and between 28 and 29, I finally couldn't deny that I was a girl anymore. And I had to ask myself as the new year rolled around, do I really want to still be in the closet on the day I turn 30? Fun side note, I was so miserable for so long 
that I felt like I was a 50-year-old grouch when I was 15. I felt old in high school. Two years on HRT, I finally feel young. I feel so much younger than I actually am. Second puberty, baby. On a similar note, what's your opinion on what age is appropriate to allow a minor to change their assigned gender? Follow up, do you wish you transitioned at an earlier age? Why, why not? Kids should be allowed to transition as soon as they know, whatever age that may be. And they should have access to the information and as much of it as possible so that they can know. There is no possible harm that could theoretically and almost certainly will not come from letting them experiment in allowing them puberty blockers so that they have more time to piece things together and that they can go off of at any time without repercussion that would be anywhere as damaging as forcing them to go through puberty as an assigned gender that they're not. All that dysphoria we've talked about, all that depression, self-loathing, depersonalization, loneliness, that's where it comes from. I was a pretty happy, outgoing kid until puberty, even with the bullying. And then I was angry, miserable, and repressed all the way until estradiol. I will not even entertain debates on this. I already lived through it. Let kids transition. Do I wish I'd transitioned at an earlier age, though? Knee-jerk answer is yes, of course, that's so much less of my life wasted. But Zoe from Stained Glass Woman made a good point that made me feel a little less bad about waiting as long as I did. We come out when we feel like we're safe to come out. And in truth, never in the entirety of the 2010s did I feel like I could. I told my audience I was gender fluid throughout my 20s, like I said, but no matter how much I wanted to tell my family the truth about myself, I never actually felt like I could say anything to them. And for no specific reason either, my family are not oppressively conservative or noticeably bigoted. One of my uncles has been openly gay with a life partner for at least as long as I've been alive. It was just one of my dysphoria symptoms. I thought I had to hide myself. Even coming out to them as just queer for Pride Month 2018 on Facebook was nerve-wracking. I had to face my own mortality before I finally decided that I had to come out as transgender and to everyone. That's what it took. And yeah, now knowing that they would be as supportive as they have been, it would have been nice to get this ball rolling a lot sooner. But I also think they needed to know and understand more about transness before they could be supportive of me. Trans people being on blast this last decade has at least meant that people at large are now more aware of us, that we really do exist, and how vulnerable we really are. To say nothing about the outdated, stereotype-laden gatekeeping in trans healthcare designed to refuse people access that was only deconstructed while I was in the closet. I think the age and date that I told my family was honestly the soonest I really could. Without explicit details, at what point did you start using public women's restrooms? Was there a degree of hesitancy? I didn't really start until this last year or so because, yeah, I was worried about being clocked. But the thing about internalized bigotry is not that it necessarily turns you into a bigot. Oh, it can, but that it makes you hyper aware of bigots and you fashion your actions around their perspective, not your own. It helped a lot that my clinic put signs on their restroom doors saying, you are welcome to use whatever restroom is most comfortable for you. That kind of gesture means a lot. And then last July, my dad and I took a road trip to Los Angeles to see Sparks and They Might Be Giants on the same bill. Bucket list show, by the way. But driving from Sacramento to LA and back, takes you through all the most conservative parts of California. So using restrooms along the way made me kind of nervous. I think I purposefully stopped taking my Spiro for a couple days just in case. Thankfully, nothing happened. It's true down there as it is everywhere else. The people who care are motivated to care. Everyone else just wants to pee and get out. How do you see your previous self since you fully transitioned? Do you recall that past person with any particular emotions attached to them? Do you equate that person to say a shell you emerged from and discarded? Or a seed you blossomed from and a tiny part still remains tethered to you? Or something else entirely? I know of a few trans creators who look back on their pre-transition selves with kindness. They recognize that whatever problems they had at the time, 
They were trying their best with what they had, and they appreciate that their old selves helped them survive long enough until they could finally live as their true selves. And it goes some way to show how much self-loathing I really had because I struggle to do the same for myself. I can now recognize my problems and flaws and what was at their root, but I don't know that I can say that I was trying my best. I was a real shithead, not a good friend or partner, and it took me way too long before I even started trying to improve myself. A shell that I emerged from and discarded feels pretty accurate, because I recall that past person with just a bitter sigh of regret and the relief that I'm not that anymore. You are you, and every gender is unique, even within the spectrum of mask and femme. How would you summarize your own gender's aesthetics? I am still unpacking a lot of stuff for my pre-transition days, and as I get more and more comfortable with my own body, so my aesthetics are always shifting little by little. I know for sure it's very feminine. It absolutely revels in softness, cuteness, and prettiness. It's perky, it's curvaceous, it's busty. It's clothed in dresses, skirts, hose, and leggings. There's lots of black, but room for all colors, especially red and purple, sometimes green, and it's never afraid to embrace pink. There's striking eye makeup, especially winged eyeliner. Nails are painted, anything shiny, really. And same for lipstick, as long as the damn thing stays put. Any recommendations on that front are very welcomed. Thank you so much for your questions, everyone. This is the end of the Safe for Work section of the video. Everything after this point will be frank and open in its details of sex and sexuality. If you need or want to stop the video here, then thank you very much for watching, and feel free to drop your own questions for another video sometime. I'll see you then. Don't watch this on the job! Any changes to masturbation? I know being on E often affects penile orgasms, with them being more diffuse feeling and more like a glow. But that body dysphoria also affects the interest. You get the idea. It varies for everyone. It absolutely does. In fact, your sexuality is one of the things that can change during your transition. Or more accurately, the more comfortable and in tune with yourself that you become, the more you hone in on what you actually are attracted to and interested in. I thought pre-transition that I was pansexual, and maybe Maybe to a degree I still am, I'm not wholly unattracted to masculine presenting people, but now I know for sure that if I wasn't with a girl, in the back of my mind I would be thinking the whole time, but I could be with a girl. I also know trans mask people going on T have a chance of losing romantic attraction in others as a side effect. They can become aromantic if they aren't already. Which is not exactly the same thing, but it's an example of how transitioning affects your fundamental understanding of yourself. So with all that said, I would say the biggest change for me in regards to masturbation after starting E is not necessarily the masturbation itself. It's the change to my libido. Testosterone is very good at making you horny, but if your body doesn't want tea in it, it cannot make you like it. I had sex with a dozen or so people pre-HRT, I didn't keep count. And only with two people did I ever actually enjoy it, that it ever actually felt good. Every other time, if I was topping, I barely felt it. I didn't dissociate per se, which is not an uncommon thing, by the way. But I would struggle for sensations or a mental image that would put me into the zone, and I never could. If I was bottoming, except for one of those two times, I didn't feel it, period, unless it hurt. And out of those two people that I enjoyed it with, only with one of them did I ever achieve orgasm during sex. And she was a cis woman, it was penetrative sex without a condom, and we were in a romantic relationship. It took all three of those criteria before I could. Any other time, no matter what I or the other person was doing, I never even got close. Oh, but I could jerk off all goddamn day and night. I had such an urge to masturbate constantly, two or three times every day. But the more years passed, the more obvious it was to me that it was only an impulse and I wasn't actually enjoying it. I was just doing it. By the last two or three years before I finally came out and went on E, I really started feeling gross and loathing myself after I'd finish. Masturbation is totally healthy and normal, to be clear. If someone tells you it isn't, they're trying to control you. I was just dysphoric and didn't know it. When I finally did start E, it knocked my libido way down. I have nowhere as much impulse to masturbate now. It is possible for you to lose your libido entirely within the first few months on E and Spiro, 
but then it'll come back as time goes on. But I feel like I'm at about the same level as when I started. I never stopped constantly thinking about sex, but I have so much less of an impulse. I can go days without it, and it is such a relief. Now I exclusively masturbate because I want to. Does change how orgasms fee is what I wrote there. And yes, E does change how orgasms feel. On T, they're more like an explosion, and they're very centered on the genitals and the muscles around them. On E, they're more like a rush or a wave, and you can feel them more throughout the body if you allow yourself to explore and play with more of yourself before you get to orgasm. What E took away from my libido, it gave to my overall sensitivity. I can engage more of my body in the pleasure and enjoy it as something that goes through all of me. It especially changed how I experienced the tail end of the orgasm as I'm coming down and the afterglow. Pre-HRT, that was the point where I would quickly clean down and try to get back to whatever I was supposed to be doing. Now, the tail is kind of the best bit. If the peak isn't quite as high as it used to be, is made up for by the tail being way longer and lingering. It's so much more relaxing and satisfying, and when I fully come down from it, I don't feel gross at all. Sometimes if it feels good enough, I'll even start giggling involuntarily. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I'm realizing I'm not as attached to my genitals as I thought I was before estradiol, and that's mainly because I used to jerk off so much. I admit I was a little worried about starting hormones because I knew it would affect my libido. Even though I long stopped enjoying masturbation, I saw it as something I just had to do. And I couldn't fathom that a reduced libido might actually be a good thing for my sense of self and even improve my sexuality. I thought for the longest time that the reason I didn't enjoy sex was because I just rubbed away all of my sensitivity by being a chronic masturbator. But now it occurs to me just how much it was probably my dysphoria. Now that I know what it's like to actually enjoy my sexuality instead of just doing it.